You know, guys, last year was the year of the Spirit. That's right. Oh, yeah. And the Spirit did incredible things. That's right. You know, as a movement, we saw some awesome things happen. Oh, yeah. We said before the Lord that we would plant 18 churches all around the world, and the Lord gave us 28. Woo! I mean, guys, this year we have before the Lord 30. What does that mean? Uh, 31, maybe. 32, maybe. 40, maybe. So, I don't know. What I do know is this. God does even more than we could ever imagine. Yeah. Another thing is this, guys. The movement grew to over 10,000 disciples for the Lord. Wow, come on. And it's been incredible to see the unity and the faith continually to forcefully advance all around the world. Just like we saw in the TNN. Here in Gainesville, I was so amazed to see this. Is that the year of the Spirit brought in new leadership into the church. Yeah. I mean, Joe and Amelia did incredible. God called myself and Megan with a team of incredible disciples to come on up here. And it's been glorious. Amen? Oh, yeah. Next up, we had the largest Bring Your Neighbor Day that this church has seen in years. With, over, with about 113 people in attendance. Guys, that's with about 48 disciples. Yeah, wow. come on, bro. 48 disciples had over one for, honestly, almost two for one visiting that day. Yeah. Now, check this out. We sent out 12 people this year from the Gainesville church, approximately 25% of the church. Wow. That's crazy. You ask any expert, if you send out 25% of your company, will it still exist? Or will it thrive? Most of the time, probably not. Like you're saying, hey, we're gonna go from 50 down to let's say 35-ish, 37, 38, in order to take care of needs all around the world. Yeah. Most people would say no to that. Gainesville, you guys, the disciples, and our leadership around the world said, let's do it. Yeah. Let's make it happen. You know, Gainesville, since it's planting, has sent out well over 100 disciples into the, into the mission field. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I'd, I'd argue that it's creeping closer to 200. Yeah. It's probably around 150, 160-ish. It's, it's getting there. And yet, what do we continue to do? Send people out. Yeah. Because when more people are sent out, more people raise up. Come on. Now, also in this church, I did the math. You might be blown away by this. But in this church alone, we raised about $80,000 for worldwide missionaries. Wow. Crazy. With a bunch of college students, a, a bunch of single professionals, some uh, one married couple. Amen. <laughs> for now. For now. Amen. Amen. Dave. Amen. Amen. Frankie. Amen. And God did that through the power of the spirit yeah. you know the spirit's awesome and the spirit's here to create miracles on this earth what more can god do in 2023 yeah. title lesson is the year of miracles point number one every disciple is a miracle every disciple is a miracle romans chapter six romans chapter six we see right here in romans six a scripture that we are all very familiar with right there in verse one says shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And then the Bible goes on and says that when Christ Jesus was baptized, or when he died on the cross, when we're baptized, we're able to participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ along with him. Yeah. You know, I want you guys to think back. Write down right now your spiritual birthday. Write that down. And just take a second to think about what that day was like. That was a miracle. I mean, guys, Albertini being saved, miracle. Oh, yeah. I'm talking big miracle. Big miracle. Megan Matthews being, I'm talking miracle. Amen? Big miracle. I mean, Janine being saved. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't hear the details in her communion, but she gave us a broad over. Uh, miracle. Amen? You being saved, absolute 100%. Miracle. You know, I believe this, guys, that sometimes we forget that one another are miracles yeah. and we treat each other as if we're not. Yeah. You know, how you treat one another is ultimately what you'll believe about one another. Sometimes I think we can easily go to a place of going through the motions and forgetting that each of us have the Spirit of God and that we are a living and dwelling of what Jesus is on this earth. You know, we got to remember that all disciples are miracles and we got to treat one another as if that is a total 
and 100% truth of the Bible because, as we know, it is. Come on, bro. You know, how you see someone is ultimately what their life will result as if you disciple them. Because how you see them will ultimately be bestowed upon them through your discipling of them, and all of a sudden you're negatively affecting them because you're not seeing them the way Jesus sees them. Come on. You know, I believe this is if a disciple's not fruitful and bearing much fruit, making disciples, it's widely because they don't believe that they themselves is a miracle that comes directly from God. Yeah. And whose fault is that? Well, firstly, we got to look inwardly, amen? Yeah. And we got to believe what the scriptures say about us individually. Come on, yeah. No man should be able to tell us who we are, who we aren't, if we are a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you and I and all of us have to have the understanding, man, we are miracles put on this earth to create miracles. You know, God calls us and commands us to be fruitful. But I believe one of the biggest things that holds us back from being fruitful is our faith. Yeah. And us believing who we are and what we can accomplish through Christ. Go over to Mark chapter 6. With you, bro. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Starting in verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogues, and many heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles that he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except for in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Jesus sends out the 12. Then Jesus went around from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure, impure spirits. Okay, so guys, what do we essentially see here? Jesus goes home and nobody believes in him. I think sometimes that's how we can get when we read the Bible. Yeah. Is this really the carpenter? The son of Mary? Brother of James and Simon? I don't know. Like, the more I read this, the more ridiculous it sounds. Just like Jesus transfigured in what world? These are fairy tales. Listen, guys, if, you're not, if we're not being fruitful, it's because of our faith. Jesus, the son of God couldn't perform many miracles in a place because of the lack of faith that was there. Now, now he still, he still did his thing, right? He healed a, a few sick people. Everywhere else where you see faith, Mark chapter 1, it was the multitudes yeah. being healed. But right here, just a couple, you know? Je Jesus did his thing, but did his thing very limitedly because of the faith of the people. Now, what was Jesus' response, though? He's like, listen, you won't have faith, I'll have faith for you. And verse 6, he says, all right, I'm going to go out and set the example. I'm going to go out, preach, teach, and proclaim. And then after he sets the example, what does he do? He sends out the 12. Mm -hmm. You know, guys, we have to understand, we can't call the people that we lead to do anything that we're not doing. Yeah. If I will never preach something from this pulpit that I'm not doing, and if I do, I will admit it to you, and I will repent from that. Like so. You know, I remember I preached earlier when I got here about how to go on great kingdom dates. And you know what was brought to my attention? That I wasn't living that out. And that I was falling short and planning my own and doing this and that. And I just wanted to apologize to you guys because I preached a standard that I simply was not holding up. And I'll admit that every time if I do that. Because I have a, a heart for righteousness. Now, I gotta preach the standard 
no matter if I'm living it or not. But you know what makes it way more effective? Is when you guys have an example to follow. Yeah. It becomes hypocritical. Yeah. I mean, now, I'm not going to be perfect. I'm still called to preach the word. But if it is a habitual thing, and a consi- it is ungodly, and not what God calls us to do. We cannot call people to do things that we are not doing. Right. Okay, I want you to ask yourself this. What limits our faith? What limits our faith? Go over to Luke chapter 8. What causes a lack of faith? Luke chapter 8. And we're going to read. This is the parable of the sower right here. And honestly, I read this yesterday, or the other day. And I was blown away. I, I forgot the parable of the sower existed for a second there. I was like, whoa. Verse 8. Or sorry, verse. Uh, let's go down to. So you, you have the three, the four soils, right? The first one, ah, it's really not one at all, right? <laughs> it just doesn't exist. Like the word doesn't do anything and Satan comes and steals it. The second one is rocky ground where, yeah, it springs up quick, but it's scorched, right? And then you got the third and the fourth one, which are both very interesting to me. Obviously the fourth one's the good soil and produces a crop 30, 60, 90, 100 times what it was, right? But the third soil I want to focus on right here. Come on, Austin. Because this is really what a lack of faith can do to us. With you, bro. Come on. The seed that fell among thorns stood for those that hear, but as they go along their way, they are choked by life worries, riches, and pleasures, and do not mature. Right. Life's worries, riches, and pleasures. You know, if we're lacking faith, it's because we're consumed with life's worries, riches, and pleasures. You know, worry is often time for the future. Like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? Riches and pleasure, that's normally for the here and now. I want to feel good now. I want to be provided for now. I want my way right now. I want this. I want that. I, 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 I. And we forget about God, 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 God. Yes. You know, when it comes down to worries, riches, and pleasures, these things will absolutely take you out. I think at the end of the day, we got to live a life that's a little uncomfortable in order not to indulge in these things, especially in a place like America. Yep. Like riches and pleasure in America, like that should be in the definition of America. Yep. Yep. Riches and pleasure, riches and pleasure. Riches and pleasure. And no matter how much riches and pleasure people have in America, they all still worry. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, when am I going to get my next fix of pleasure? Yeah. When am I going to get my next? Guys, we literally have the opportunity. Like, we have Netflix where every episode of a show is right there. Yeah. And yet we're still, like, itching and scratching ourselves to find the next one. Yeah. We're like, dude, what do you mean? It's right there. So no matter what, before, back in, back in my day, you know what I mean? Before, you had to wait a whole week for a new episode. And I was itching and scratching for that. Now I'm giving that even more and I'm still itching and scratching. Now they're going to start releasing two seasons at a time. And you know what? I'm still going to be itching and scratching. I, 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 I just need more. No matter what, you're always going to want more. You need to limit yourself, limit your heart, to all the things this world can provide and focus in on what Jesus gives. And that's life through the Spirit. Simple as that. You know, we learn from this scripture and we know for a fact that once saved, always saved, not a biblical doctrine. You can lose your salvation just like you can lose anything else in this world. And just like here in the scripture says, hey, once you, what happens, our maturity is taken out because of these things. You can become mature in Christ and fall back into being an infant. Yeah. Because you go back to these ways of indulging in the worries, riches, and pleasures of life. Yeah. Now I want, you to, I want to ask you guys something. Is your schedule set up to bear fruit? Does your schedule reflect, I am focused on bearing fruit for God? What does that mean? You have a great and quiet time. What does that mean? You set out and you are on a mission to share your faith. Even if you don't set aside an hour, two hours, three hours a day, you say this, I'm going to go run errands and I'm going to share my faith with every single person I let my eyes fall on. Yeah. Every single one. And I'm going to allocate an hour and a half to grocery shop instead of 30 minutes because I know I'm going to need an extra hour because I'm going to be preaching the word. You know what I mean? Amen. 
Now, maybe some of your lives can't even do that. You can still find a way to share with a few people here and there. Yeah. Is your schedule, your heart, your life, your mindset set up to bear fruit? Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 21. Come on, brother. We love this one. Revelation. Okay. We, we, don't, we don't have to sing from there. We can leave there. Revelation chapter 21. Go, Austin. Good stuff, bro. Revelation chapter 21. And we're going to read verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. You know, it's crazy how cowardly and believers top the list. That blows my mind. I'm like, dude, immoral people, pff, they need to repent. I'm like, liars, they need to repent. Idolatry, I need to repent. And I look inwardly, and I look at all the areas that I've had doubt in my life, in my walk with God, and just yesterday or this week. And I'm convicted to the core. Because those who live in cowardness and unbelief have the same destination as those who live in these egregious sins. We get radical when it comes to sexual morality. We bring people on up here, and we're like, hey, listen, guys, this is where this person's been. This is church discipline, blah, blah, blah. They need some time away from the church, yada, yada. We don't do that for cowardly and unbelieving. Right. Wow. Right. Preach it. Uh, it's just become acceptable in our churches yeah. to say, you know what? I get it. You're just timid, and that's the way God created you. False. That's a lie from Satan. Oh, I'm just shy. I can't. No. False. Yeah. Lie from Satan. There are many people in the Bible, Timothy, to name one, who struggled with timidity. Yeah. Yeah. And yet he overcame through the power of the Spirit. Come on, bro. Right. You know, I, I want to confess my cowardness and my desire for repentance and my decision to repent right Let's now. Go, I just did it. I repented. You know, there's been many opportunities that I've had to share with certain people, to sit down with certain people, to talk to certain people, and I shied away from it because I was a little uncomfortable. I was like, ah, it's just not the right time. You know, God, the Spirit's not, not prompting me. No, no, no. My cowardness was constricting me. The spirit was there, but my cowardness overwhelmed it because I wasn't filled with the spirit. Wow. There's a difference between being filled and receiving. That's right. You could be, you could receive the Holy Spirit, but not be filled with it. And in those moments, sadly, guys, in my shame, I was not filled. Mm. I repented, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna preach the word like I've never done before. Awesome. I'm gonna say the uncomfortable things, yes. the weird things, whatever needs to be said. I wanna, I wanna turn some stones over in people's hearts. Come on, bro. All for the glory of God. If you are in cowardness and you are sitting there in the right union, like, I just need to share my faith, but I'm just so scared. You got to get up and just do it. You know, I, I, I remember I wanted to grow in being bold at FIU. I wanted to grow. And I was appointed a Bible talk leader, but I had no guy on campus with me all day. All my, all my guys in my, in my Bible talk, one was a PhD student, one worked full time and went to school, and the other one also worked full time. So basically they all worked full time and I'm on campus all day by myself. I put myself on staff and I'm like, well, I got no guy to walk with hand in hand. What do I do now? Well, I got to get my butt out there and share my faith. Yeah. So what did I do? I planted my feet in the most populated part on campus. And every time little footstep passed me, hey, excuse me. And then I had no idea who it was. I didn't know if it was a woman, a man, a little kid, a dog. I had no idea. I was like, hey, excuse me. And they were like, hey, what's up, man? I'm like, hey, dude, let, let me tell you about this. Hey, how's it going, man? Oh, hey, I'm not a man. I'm like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, what well, man? You know what I mean? Uh, you know, it was awkward. It was cringy. It was, honestly, it probably looked stupid. I felt stupid. But after the first five, I'm like, I could do this. I feel like, I feel like the walking prophet. You know, you got the weeping prophet, and you got the walking prophet. And I just fought for it. And then we had missions. And I went raffling for sometimes eight, five, six, seven, eight hours a day. Sitting in the same place where it was populated saying, you believe in helping people? It's just, by myself, guys. Nobody there to guide me, to direct me, nothing. I said, I will not be cowardice. Yeah. I'm going to be bold. Amen. I think, sadly, I shied away from that ever since I started having guys who were willing to walk with me. Um, 
and I got to get back to it. Let's go on. I got to get back fired up. I'm gonna, guys, I'm gonna find days where I just say, you know what? I'm gonna go out to Weimar right there in that little tunnel, and I'm gonna listen for little footsteps. I'm gonna plant myself over there in Turlington. I'm gonna listen for little footsteps. And I want you guys to do the same. Amen. You can do it. Guys, it is, it is scary waiting for little footsteps, okay? You guys can see. And I'm not saying like, oh my gosh, I have a harder time so you can do it. Actually, you know what? I am saying that. You can totally do it. If I can do it, you can do it. And if we can do it, God can do it through us. Let's fight for it together. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans 10, verse 17. The answer is always faith. Faith comes from hearing the message of Christ. In our D times, when we preach, in our Bible studies, we need to share the word of God. And this is what will bring Faith. I heard someone say to me the other day, yeah, I think I'm going to have a D time but not show any scriptures. <laughs> what? Now, I'm not saying you can't have fun times with people, right. but scriptures should fill your times with everyone. Yeah. Not where you're like just rebuking everyone, but you know, oftentimes I quote scriptures and just sharing my heart with people. Yeah. You know, just like it says here, right. man, I just, this is what I'm feeling. Just like it says, but if you don't know the Bible, you can't quote the Bible. Right. And if you're not taught the Bible, you'll never know the Bible. Wow. Yeah. Come on, bro. And so, guys, in order for us to be the people God has called us to be, we need to make a decision to believe in the scriptures. I, I have a simple challenge, guys. Read the Bible this year, all the way through. Every single one of us, together as a family. Read, I don't care if you do it in one month, two months, six months, or 12 months. That's a lot of time to read the Bible. That probably chalks up to maybe four chapters a day. Maybe five. Read the Bible this year and get the faith to know you are a miracle. Point number one, every disciple is a miracle, or sorry, point number two, every disciple is a miracle worker. Yeah. Come on, bro. Yeah. You know, guys, preaching builds churches. Like, you could go out by yourself and start a church, straight up. Because that's what preaching does. Go over to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, I'm gonna quote this one. But essentially, in Ezekiel 37, many of you guys know this, talks about the valley of dry bones. Oh, the dry bones. Who wants to go there? You know what I mean? But every disciple is called to go to that valley and to preach life into these dry bones. You know, some of the driest bones that exist on this earth are people who were once disciples and fell away. Yeah. Because of bitterness, yeah. sin, immorality, impurities, a lack of trust. Maybe because they were just simply hurt. Yeah. So many different things. Some of the driest bones are of those, are of those who have walked away from God. Mm. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I believe this is the biggest reason why people walk away from God. And you or I are not above it any little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to read verses, verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. What are you, then it is I or they. This is what we preach, and this is what you believe. You know, I, I believe the reason people fall away is because they forget about the grace of God. Yeah. They forget about how much they've been forgiven. You know, this is, we are not above this, guys. Far from it. And we got to understand that when it comes down to God's grace, if it doesn't prompt you to work hard for God, you probably don't understand his grace. I love what Dave shared today because it goes hand in hand. Like, is it the quiet times and, the, and, and the, all this? Yeah, yeah, you need to do those things and your quiet times will get you close to God. But if you don't find that special nugget every day, you don't know God. No, that's not how it works. But you got to understand that, that the grace of God should push you towards those things. Amen. Yeah. Yes, you are unblemished and you are perfect in the sight of God. But that grace should not go without effect. That's right. And it should push you towards wanting to work harder than anyone. Not out of a competition, 
But out of just saying, dude, I am so grateful. I am a wretched sinner who God has had favor on. Yep. You know, I look at a lot of people who have fallen away and their bones are really dry. And they forgot about the grace of God. My challenge from this point is simple. Let's call every single person that has fallen away from this church, from God's church, from a relationship with him, and let's make a, a decision, radical, to call them every week. Call them every week. I mean, this is kind of quiet. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't know if you guys are, you know, Call them every week. Just pick someone. Pick two people, whatever. Maybe they're close to you. I, I think sometimes people fall away and we're like, hey, another one bites the dust. No. Another one bites the dust, but we need to care enough to say we want them to bite the spirit once more. Right. Come on, bro. So that's my simple chat. So for those who have fallen away, but also those who have made it so far through the Bible studies, maybe they fell off because of something. Maybe they made it all the way through and we're so fired up for them. I want to call you guys to call them weekly as well. Because sometimes people start studying the Bible and it's almost like they're the plague to us now. Like, hey, you don't want it? Fine, huh? fine. I'll just dust my feet off. Bye. Let's reach out to those people. Now, if they are totally denying you, like, I don't want anything to do with you, amen. You know what I mean? Like, if they don't want anything to do with you, there's nothing you could do about that. But for those who left saying, I love this, I love this church, but I can't follow it yet. Or I, I don't have it in my heart to give up everything. Those people, they want it, but they don't see that they have the power to do it. Yeah. My challenge, call them weekly. Let's make disciples of these people and let's restore souls back to God. Point number three, last and final point, is all nations will be reached by miracles. All nations will be reached by miracles. If I can have Megan come on up here. Uh, if you guys look on your seat or under your seat, there's three papers there. And I wanted to give you guys a basic overview of what God's movement is doing. Okay? Are you guys with me? I'm with you, bro. Okay. I know this is a little longer than normal, but this is inspiring stuff. All right? If you want to be a revolutionary person, a world changer, you got to listen up to this. Okay? Come on, bro. So first things first is the world will be reached with miracles. And we've already seen so many miracles. First things first is the Crown of Thorns project. Now, the Crown of Thorns project consisted of this. I'm going to explain uh, briefly the first part, and then I need to look at a paper to explain the rest, and so I can't see the paper, so Megan's going to explain it for me. Amen? Well, Megan. But first things first, the first phase was to plant 12 churches in arguably the most influential places around the world. Those 12, right? And incredibly... That was completed at the GLC in 2017 when the Hong Kong church was sent out. Amen? Amen. And Megan's going to describe the next phases. So on your paper, you can see the 12 right here. And the, the theme scripture of Acts 1, 8, which Austin already read today, is Jerusalem is Los Angeles, Judea is Samaria, is United States and Canada. So the plan is how to go from LA out throughout the entire world. That's why it's called the crown of thorns. And so with these 12, the first phase, we hit major cities around the world in all the various countries. Mm -hmm. The second phase is how the, each one of those in the first phase, those 12 from there, they're now their Jerusalem in their world sector mm -hmm. and being able to reach out to the rest of the world. And all these down here that are listed, um, you see the code here, Green is church plantings, purple is remnant groups, and red still need to be planted. And I did not count how many that is. Then phase three is countries pillar church evangelizes their nation. And so we will see it continue throughout so that we can reach the entire world. Amen. That, guys, that's a thorough plan to turn the world upside down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if a church, movement of churches do not have a plan to revolutionize this world, then they need to think twice about what their mission on this earth really is. Yeah. Right. Because this is what we were put here to do. Guys, this world will be a better place when the world knows Jesus. Come on, I'm sorry, guys. It's not, it's not world hunger that's the issue. It's not the water that's the issue. It's not, it is the lack of knowledge of who Jesus really is. That's the issue. Yeah. Right. Now, the second paper right there is Operation Eagle. That's the second one, right? Yep. And Operation Eagle is essentially, I might be able to describe this one. Tell me if I do a good job, Megan. It's essentially to get a discipling church in every single state of America. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, we are in 37 states. 
Yeah. Out of 50. Like Luke said, that's about three or two thirds of the states. After this year, we're going to get into eight, no, seven more states, and we will be in about 44 states out of 50. And then in 2024, we'll close out strong and plant the last six. Now, that's unless God intervenes once again and just does his thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Either he slows us down or he speeds us up. Whatever he does, we know that God has a great plan for Operation Eagle. Yeah. And in the same way, there's the code of the same thing. Is that basically it? Yes. Okay. It's not, the paper isn't color-coded, but you can pretty much tell by the shades of gray. Yes, guys, we ran out of color ink. Come on. <laughs> um, now, the cool thing is this. With the churches and Operation Eagle being planted, what it allows is for us to help out our third world plantings. Sadly, most of this world is abundantly third world. Yeah. We're in the first world, but there's a lot less of us than there are in the third world. Yeah. You guys, literally a quarter of the world's population resides in, no, actually more, I think it's a third of the world's population resides in either India or China. Wow. Most of those people, very, very poor. Yeah. Very poor. And that's why we're trying to expand in the U.S. so that way we can have the funds necessary to not say, hey, I'm going to hold on to this and build up the USA. No, I'm going to send it out so that way all nations can get saved. And then the final page is all 30 of the church plantings this year. I won't ask Megan to read those because Luke or Brandon read them all. But five of those we're going to be sending out directly from the Sages World Sector. Number one, Mumbai, India. Number two, Colombo, Sri Lanka. You guys know where that's at? Neither do I. I'm just kidding. It's south of India. It's like an island nation. And it's incredible. We got to get there. Number three, Port of Spain, Trinidad. That's in the Caribbean. Yaman, you know what I'm saying? Number four, Daytona Beach, Florida. Amen. And number five, Knoxville, Tennessee. Amen. I know Kathy's excited for that one. That is our plan. Thank you so much, Megan. You sit down. That is our plan to revolutionize this world. And Philippians chapter 4 tells us directly that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. But check it out. Let's go to Philippians 4. Come on, Austin. Oh. Philippians 4. In verse 13, it tells us that we can do all, all things, right? But check this out. Look what verse 14 says. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Let's stop there. You're going to do great things, but not without great troubles. Yeah. This is the year of miracles, but guess what? The persecution is going to be heavier than ever. The hardship may be heavier than ever, but we know when God's people went through the toughest times, God came through in the greatest of ways. Come on, bro. You know, uh, to close out, I just want to share a brief story. You know, in the former fellowship, there was a church leader in the Middle East who was building his church, and it was cranking. So many souls were coming to Christ. It was amazing. It was mind-blowing. And then one day, he baptizes this young man, man named Nazar. And Nazar was a cranking young disciple who preached the word wherever he went. But they could get in a lot of trouble for preaching the, world, the word in this country, and sure enough, they did. I'm almost certain this was in Iraq. And when they were in prison for preaching the word, they were separated. And the church leader at the time, he was praising and worshiping God in his cell, hoping and praying that he would get out, but nonetheless holding to the conviction of God. You know, by God, God's miraculous hand, they were both put on a bus to be transported. And what do you know? They were able to sit right next to each other. And you know what Nazar said to this, to his to his leader, the church leader, he says, I'm faithful to the Lord. Mm. Tell the church, I'm faithful and I will never give up. Mm. You know, the church leader was released, but Nazar died in prison. Mm. But what did he die? Faithful mm -hmm. to the Lord. Come on. We will face hardships. Yeah. We will face opposition. Mm -hmm. But we got to understand something big. On. God is on our side. You know, from one church in 2008 to now, over a, oh, about 150 churches around the world. And by the end of this year, we'll be in 72 nations. God has advanced this movement. And it's not a movement of man, but a movement of our Lord 
our God. Come on, bro. If it wasn't, God would crush it and stop it. And if we become unrighteous, he will. But if we hold to his teachings, fired up and faithful as ever, we will continue to move forward for the glory of God. Come on, bro. I have a vision for this church. I talked about it with the cops, and this is what I want us to simply focus on. I'm gonna, I have a, a, a thorough thing, but I'm not going to go all into that. But this, Operation 72. Oh, yeah. Come on. Operation 72. Come on. The goal is this. Every disciple matures in life and doctrine in order for us to grow this church to 72 sold-out disciples for the Lord by the end of the year. Come on. We're at 47. I mean, 25 away. That's not really hard at all. That's right. But what becomes hard is when we get in our own way. Yeah. We got to live out the commands of God, live out the Holy Scripture. Remember that you are a miracle. You are a miracle worker, and it is miracles that will transform this world for Christ. I love you, family. Let's have an incredible year of the Spirit, and to God be all the glory. Amen.